Die Sendung Geschichte am Mittwoch wird Ihnen präsentiert von Vacheron Constantin. Uhrenmanufaktur seit 1755. America prepares to face attack on its cities and atomic bomb destruction. A screen of Air Force units goes into action to protect our borders from the unannounced arrival of the enemy. The enemy who apparently knows no mercy and who has signified his intention to conquer the world under the banner of communist imperialism. In the president's own words, it will require all of us to get ready to defend our homes. Am 25. Juni 1950 marschiert Nordkorea in Südkorea ein. Vor dem Hintergrund des Kalten Krieges und des Kampfes gegen die sowjetischen Expansionsbestrebungen beschließt die amerikanische Regierung, militärisch zu intervenieren. Überall in den USA greift die Angst vor dem Kommunismus um sich. May Day brings a wave of anti-communist sentiment as 100.000 march down New York Fifth Avenue in a loyalty parade, reviewed by Francis Cardinal Spellman and Mayor Dwyer. In the land of liberty, virtually every national group and every religious denomination are represented, presenting a united front. Conducted under the auspices of the Catholic Church, during which Cardinal Spellman again joins in the denunciation of communism on the day that has traditionally belonged to red forces throughout the world. Zwei Jahre zuvor hat Präsident Truman einen Ausschuss ins Leben gerufen, der die Loyalität der Bundesbeamten überprüfen soll. Die Behörden erhalten Anweisungen, jeden zu entlassen, der ihrer Ansicht nach die Sicherheit der Vereinigten Staaten bedroht. Das FBI legt eine Kartei an, stellt eine Liste von Personen auf, die den Interessen des Landes schaden könnten, führt eine Postzensur ein und installiert heimlich Mikrofone oder Abhörgeräte. Zahlreiche Angestellte, Arbeiter und Lehrer verlieren ihren Arbeitsplatz. Im State Department werden 31 Beamte, deren Post abgefangen wurde, der Homosexualität verdächtigt und entlassen. Amerika tritt in eine Ära der Inquisition ein. Auch der Kongress ist nicht untätig geblieben. Das Repräsentantenhaus verfügt über den sogenannten Ausschuss zur Untersuchung unamerikanischer Umtriebe. Ganz Hollywood gibt sich die Klinke in die Hand. Mehrere prominente Persönlichkeiten werden zu Gefängnisstrafen verurteilt. You consider them to be the agents of a foreign government. I do so, yes. Die Verhaftung des brillanten US-Diplomaten Alger Hills rückt den republikanischen Senator für Wisconsin, den Hinterbänkler Joseph McCarthy, ins Rampenlicht. Hills wird beschuldigt, Geheimdokumente an die Sowjetunion weitergegeben zu haben. Der übereifrige Untersuchungsbeamte, der den angeblichen Verräter entlarven konnte, ist der kalifornische Abgeordnete Richard Nixon. I am holding in my hand a microfilm a very highly confidential secret State Department documents. These documents were fed out of the State Department over 10 years ago by communists who were employees of that department and who were interested in seeing that these documents were sent to the Soviet Union. Wisconsin's controversial Joseph McCarthy nimmt Nixons Rede zum Anlass, um den Einfluss der Kommunisten auf das State Department anzuprangern. Er erklärt, er besitze eine Liste von 205 kommunistischen Agenten, die das Außenministerium unterwandert hätten. Später wird McCarthy zugeben, dass diese Liste nie existierte. 
McCarthy ist besessen von dem Glauben an eine kommunistische Verschwörung und benutzt den Senat, um Amerika in eine endlose Hexenjagd zu verwickeln. Ihr widmet er sich hemmungslos während seiner kurzen vierjährigen Karriere, die ihn berühmt machen sollte. Als Vorsitzender des Senatsausschusses zur Untersuchung unamerikanischer Umtriebe leitet Joseph McCarthy die Anhörungen. Unterstützt von seinem loyalen Mitarbeiter Roy Cohn. We do not have the right to exclude from the room any media of information. We feel we cannot exclude television any more than we could exclude newsmen. However, uh, the television must be handled in such a way that will not uh, embarrass the witness, will not cause him any discomfiture. Uh, also, counsel is entitled not to have any bright lights shined upon him. Uh, Could you turn those lights a little more? You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you get. I do. Sit down. Bei seinen öffentlichen Auftritten verwandelt McCarthy den Senat und seine Ausschüsse in Theaterbühnen, auf denen er stets unweigerlich dasselbe Stück spielt. Ein immer zahlreicheres Publikum von Schaulustigen drängt in diese Vorstellungen, bei denen McCarthy nach Lust und Laune und auf der Grundlage von Indiskretionen oder Denunzierungen die Verantwortlichen für die amerikanische Außenpolitik auftreten lässt. Er beschuldigt insbesondere Lehrer, Regierungsbeamte, Journalisten und Hochschuldozenten, im Auftrag der Sowjets eine kommunistische Verschwörung zu betreiben. McCarthys Absicht ist es, sie in Schauprozessen vor einer Öffentlichkeit bloßzustellen, die nie etwas Vergleichbares erlebt hat. Die Anschuldigungen sind schwer. McCarthy zufolge hat die feindliche Sowjetunion die Kontrolle über die Exekutive übernommen und lenkt die Außenpolitik der Vereinigten Staaten. To hire men not on the basis of ability, but on the basis of political belief. Now, both of these, we say, indicate an unconstitutional purpose, a purpose to invade the domain protected by the First Amendment, which is uh, the provision that Congress shall pass no law invading the freedom of speech or of conscience. Im Laufe der Zeit kann sich McCarthy einen regelrechten Nachrichtendienst aufbauen. Seine Informationen erhält er von den offiziellen Abteilungen des FBI, aber auch auf persönliche Initiative von Behördenbeamten. Anfang 1951 geht McCarthy zum Angriff auf Hollywood über. Schauspieler, Drehbuchautoren und Regisseure müssen sich gegen den Vorwurf verteidigen, kommunistische Verschwörer zu sein. Es kursieren schwarze Listen mit den Namen jener, die auszuschalten sind, darunter auch die Schauspieler Humphrey Bogart und Lauren Bacall. Zu den fanatischen Teilnehmern dieser Hexenjagd gehört der Schauspieler Ronald Reagan. Denunziationen avancieren zum Verteidigungsinstrument. Um die eigene Unschuld zu beweisen, werden Namen genannt. Als ehemaliges Mitglied der Kommunistischen Partei sagte Lia Kazan, was er über den Einfluss der Kommunisten auf die Filmindustrie zu wissen glaubt. Arthur Miller dagegen preist den Mut der Gegner dieser Inquisition und prangert die Feigheit an. Zum Opfer einer Pressekampagne wird Charlie Chaplin. Denn auch nach 41 Jahren in den USA will er noch immer nicht die amerikanische Staatsbürgerschaft annehmen. Er flüchtet sich 1952 nach Europa. Joseph Lucy, seit 1947 auf der schwarzen Liste, folgt seinem Beispiel. Die Polizei verhaftet Streikende, die die Eingänge der Hollywood-Studios blockieren. Zu den Belastungszeugen gehört auch Walt Disney. Die wachsende Aufmerksamkeit, die McCarthys Enthüllungen erregen, zwingt das Weiße Haus, wo dieselbe Paranoia gegenüber dem Kommunismus herrscht, eine ähnliche Position einzunehmen. Präsident Truman erklärt, wenn das Vaterland in Gefahr ist, sind persönliche Freiheiten zweitrangig. Auf Drängen von McCarthy muss die Unredlichkeit eines Beamten nun nicht mehr bewiesen werden. Zur Rechtfertigung einer Entlassung genügen bloße Zweifel. Gegen 26.000 Angestellte der Bundesbehörden wird umfassend ermittelt. 7.000 quittieren den Dienst und 739 werden entlassen. Entweder wegen Mitgliedschaft in einer sogenannten subversiven Organisation oder wegen sexueller Immoralität oder Homosexualität. Die von der Exekutive eröffnete Hexenjagd ist in vollem Gange. 
Im Juni desselben Jahres werden Julius und Ethel Rosenberg verhaftet, zwei Jahre später exekutiert. Ihnen wird vorgeworfen, den Sowjets Informationen über die Atombombe geliefert zu haben. McCarthy avanciert zum Nationalhelden. Er schreckt nicht davor zurück, den Verteidigungsminister zu verunglimpfen, den er als Hauptverantwortlichen für die Verschwörung und den weltweiten Rückzug der USA betrachtet. Und er geht sogar so weit, den Präsidenten höchstpersönlich einen Dreckskerl zu schimpfen. Hauptnutznießer der McCarthy-Ära ist jedoch die Republikanische Partei, die den Senator schützt, weil seine Unterstützung im nächsten Wahlkampf für sie von unschätzbarem Wert ist. 1952 stellt sich Eisenhower zur Wahl und macht Richard Nixon zu seinem Vizepräsidenten. Ihr Wahlkampf konzentriert sich auf drei Themen und drei Feinde. Korea, den Kommunismus und die Korruption. Später sollte sich herausstellen, dass McCarthy gegen das Gesetz verstieß, indem er zur Begleichung seiner Spielschulden hohe Bestechungsgelder von der Firma Pepsi-Cola für die Liberalisierung des Zuckerpreises annahm. Eisenhower wird gewählt. Dies ist der erste Wahlsieg der Republikaner seit 1920. Bereits im Januar 1953 ist McCarthy erneut Vorsitzender des Ausschusses zur Untersuchung unamerikanischer Umtriebe und setzt seinen Kreuzzug fort. Die McCarthy-Ära erreicht ihren Höhepunkt. Aus öffentlichen Büchereien und Schulbibliotheken werden über 50.000 Titel verbannt. As antiquated and stupid religious phenom phenomena. Was that your feeling at that time? My feeling was that professors should have the right to express their considered opinions on any subject, whatever they were, sir. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Communists and socialists should be allowed to teach in the schools. They should have the right to teach anything that came to their minds as being a proper thing to teach. I was suspended from classes on April 1st and I resigned from the university. When you resigned from the university. There are thousands of able and loyal employees in the federal government of the United States who have been properly cleared according to the laws and the security practices of their agencies as I was. Ende Februar weist der Verteidigungsminister seine Offiziere an, nicht mehr vor McCarthys Ausschuss zu erscheinen. Die Öffentlichkeit ist beunruhigt und die Presse äußert sich erstmals kritisch. McCarthy beginnt unbequem zu werden. Und die Regierung Eisenhower hat keine Verwendung mehr für ihn. Of course there are risks if we are not vigilant. But we do not have to be hysterical. We can be vigilant, we can be American. Im März 53 dann der erste schwere Schlag. McCarthy wird in einer CBS-Sendung attackiert. Senator McCarthy claims that only the left-wing press criticized him. Let us look at some of these left-wing papers. The Herald Tribune of New York. McCarthyism involves assaults on basic Republican concepts, the Milwaukee Journal. The line must be drawn and defended or McCarthy will become the government. The evening star of Washington. It was a bad day for everyone who resents and detests the bully boy tactics which Senator McCarthy so often employs. The New York World Telegram. Bamboozling, bludgeoning, distorting way. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Unscrupulous, McCarthy bullying. What a tragic irony it is that the president's political advisors keep him from doing what every decent instinct must be commanding him to do. The line between investigating and persecuting is a very fine one, and the junior senator from Wisconsin has stepped over it repeatedly. His primary achievement has been in confusing the public mind as between the internal and the external threats of communism. We must not confuse dissent with disloyalty. We must remember always that accusation is not proof. Einen Monat später muss sich McCarthy vor dem Senat zur Scheinaffäre äußern. Der Senator und sein Mitarbeiter Roy Cohn beschuldigen das militärische Oberkommando, den Soldaten David Schein verfolgt und als Geisel festgehalten zu haben. Schein war dem McCarthy-Komitee zur Untersuchung einer eventuellen kommunistischen Unterwanderung von Militärstützpunkten zur Verfügung gestanden. Der Fall des Soldaten Schein ist der lang erwartete ideale Vorwand, um sich McCarthy vom Hals zu schaffen. Mit Zustimmung von Präsident Eisenhower kann nun McCarthys Hinrichtung beginnen, in Form einer Live-Sendung. Zum ersten Mal sind Fernsehkameras im Senat zugelassen. Die tägliche achtstündige Live-Übertragung der Anhörungen macht sie zum größten politischen Spektakel in der Geschichte der USA. 20 Millionen Fernsehzuschauer lernen 36 Tage lang in insgesamt 187 Stunden Sendezeit McCarthys wahres Gesicht kennen und erleben, wie unausstehlich er sein kann. 
Aus diesen 187 Stunden hat der Regisseur Emile de Antonio den Film Point of Order zusammengeschnitten, der McCarthys Sturz nachzeichnet. Im Laufe der Anhörungen enthüllt der Film die Paranoia des Senators, der erleben muss, wie seine Stützen ihn nacheinander im Stich lassen. Of our government, then just as certain as you sit there, in the period of our lives, you will see a red world. Once you have this United States, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, covered with a network, a network of professors and teachers, who are getting their orders from Moscow, from an organization that wants to destroy this nation, that wants to corrupt the minds of youth, then, Mr. Jenkins, we are rapidly losing the battle. The thing that the American people can do is to be vigilant day and night, to make sure they don't have communists teaching the sons and daughters of America. There is no remote possibility of this war which we're in today, and it's a war, war which we've been losing, no remote possibility of this ending except by victory or by death for this civilization. An der Untersuchung der Scheinaffäre sind beteiligt Robert Stevens, Heeresminister, John Adams, Berater der Armee, Joseph Welch, Anwalt des Pentagon. Karl Mund, Vorsitzender. Ray Jenkins, Anwalt des Unterausschusses. John McClellan, Senator für Arkansas. Stuart Symington, Senator für Missouri. Und Roy Cohn, McCarthy's rechte Hand. I suggest in the interest of these hearings, the charges are often forgotten. The charges were, did Senator McCarthy and two members of his staff use improper pressure for Mr. David Schein with the Army? The counter charge was that there was blackmail on the part of the Army and the use of Mr. Schein as a hostage. Now, those are the charges that have been made. Gentlemen of the committee, in order that we may all be quite clear as to just why this hearing has come about, from mid-July of last year until March 1st of this year, David Schein was discussed between one branch or other of the Department of the Army and Senator McCarthy or members of his staff in more than 65 telephone calls. This matter was discussed at approximately 19 meetings between Army personnel and Senator McCarthy or members of his staff. Let's talk about Schein, an experience similar to none which I have had in my life. Mr. Cohn became extremely agitated and uh, uh, he became extremely abusive. The thing that he was so violent about was the fact that I said to Cohn that I'd like to give him some advice. I pointed out to him that the national interest required that Shine be treated just like every other show soldier. You mean you were breaking the news gently, Mr. Yes, sir. That is right. He responded with vigor and force. I said, oh, Roy, don't say that. I said, come on. Really, what is going to happen? And he responded with even more force. We'll wreck the army. that you have no recollection of it. No, sir. I, I say I do not recall having said that. Well, that, that's what, that's what I get your answer yes, to sir. Now, you don't recall having said it. No, sir. But you don't deny it. Sir, I'm saying I'm sure I did not say that. I am sure All I right, did. now you're saying you did not say it, Mr. Cohn. Yes, sir. I say Where I am sure that I did not make that statement. And I am sure that Mr. Adams and anybody else with any sense could not ever believe that I was threatening to wreck the army or that I could wreck the army. I say, sir, the statement is ridiculous. I'm talking about Stevens being through a secretary of the army. That's, that's equally ridiculous, sir. And untrue. Yes, sir, equally ridiculous and untrue. The 
treatment accorded and the opportunities afforded Mr. Shine after his entry into the military service should be the same as for any other American citizen, no more and no less. Mr. Cohn came to my office at 11.20 a.m. You felt that Mr. Cohn was being too persistent or was trying to high pressure anyone? Not me, sir. To hold this boy shine as a sort of a hostage and use him as a bait for the purpose of abating this investigation, was he? Certainly not. Mr. Chairman, I want to point out that I think that question is completely improper and unfair. The implication is that this chairman could have been bought off. All the evidence is that this chairman, could, under no circumstances, had been bought off this investigation. Private Shine almost invariably rode in the cab of the truck, whereas the other soldiers, sometimes numbering 40 and 50, were packed like cattle or sheep in the bed of the truck and exposed to the weather. Did you learn that? No, sir. I've been in the military for a while. I've never seen young men treated like cattle. And I know that... <laughs> I don't think we should let it grow to the mothers of this country that their sons are being treated like cattle, because they are not. <laughs> don't, don't you think, uh, actually, Mr. Secretary, that this is all uh, ridiculous in the extreme? for this committee and all of these competent army officers to be sitting here trying to find out why a private in the army was successively promoted until he is finally up to the very top position of private. What do you think? Well, I think you would like to have had him something other than a private. <laughs> That wasn't your fault, Senator. Right. <lacht> Präsident Eisenhower hat eine Direktive an den Verteidigungsminister ausgegeben, die es allen seinen Mitarbeitern strikt untersagt, vor dem Unterausschuss des Senats Dokumente vorzulegen oder sich zu vertraulichen Gesprächen zu äußern. This is a letter signed Dwight D. Eisenhower, addressed to the Honorable the Secretary of Defense, Washington, D.C. Dear Mr. Secretary, it is essential to the successful working of our system that the persons entrusted with power in any one of the three great branches of government shall not encroach upon the authority confided to the others. The ultimate responsibility for the conduct of the executive branch rests with the president. You will instruct employees of your department that in all of their appearances before the subcommittee of the Senate Committee on Government Operations regarding the inquiry now before it, They are not to testify to any such conversations or communications or to produce any such documents or reproductions. This separation is vital to preclude the exercise of arbitrary power by any branch of the government. Sincerely, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Senator McCarthy or Mr. Cohn. I don't believe that this is the result of President Eisenhower's own personal thinking. Someone for his own benefit, should contact the president immediately and point out to him, perhaps, that he and I and many of us campaigned and promised the American people we would no longer involve, uh, engage in government by secrecy, whitewash, and cover-up, because the American people will not stand for this. Let's go through, let's lay all the facts upon the table. And we can't lay the facts upon the table if we're going to draw an iron curtain. I think that uh, Eisenhower has been badly advised. Now, Mr. Chairman, other... just a moment, may, may, may I finish? This is an instruction from the President of the United States, and I consider myself bound by it, Mr. sir. Mr. Chairman, we've spent just a vast amount of time here trying to get answers to some simple question. The question is this. You made a statement this morning under oath. You say, I wish to make it perfectly plain that the decisions and the acts on the part of the Army concerning the controversy presently being heard by the Senate subcommittee were the decisions and the acts of the Department of the Army alone. Now, do you, do you still stand by that statement? I do. 
I'm sure that any man who can add two and two, Mr. Secretary, will agree that that completely contradicts your statement that all decisions were the decisions of the Department of the Army alone. I wonder if you want your, your sworn testimony this morning to stand as it is or not. I want it to stand. Does this mean I'm a communist, Senator? That's awfully funny, isn't it, Mr. Secretary? That's terribly funny. I, no, I when you made it very clear to you at all times that I felt that you were anti-communist. I also made it very clear to you that I thought that you were very naively and unintelligently anti-communist. May I finish, Mr. Chairman? I think this is infinitely more important than anything we bring out of this hearing. McCarthy hatte sich auf illegale Weise ein streng vertrauliches Schreiben des FBI-Chefs beschafft. Dieser Fauxpas dient nun dazu, McCarthy zu vermitteln, dass auch FBI-Chef Edgar Hoover ihn fallen gelassen hat. The original, I want to question the secretary as to whether or not the original of this and other letters like it are in his file. I want to make it very clear that I have gotten neither this letter nor anything else from the FBI. Chairman, I, I assure you the, this purported copy did not come from the Army files, nor does the senator for a moment suggest it did. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if Mr. Welch is going to say there's not a copy of this in the Army files, he should be sworn because that statement is untrue as far as I know. There I is did an exact... not say that, Senator. I said that this purported copy did not come from the Army files, and you know I'm quite right, sir. And I have an absorbing curiosity to know how in the dickens you got hold of it. I'll wager you. <laughs> I, will... I think you should read the last I'd like to have right? the advice of uh, counsel, if I may, as to whether or not I'm at liberty to, to discuss a letter from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover. Well, you're at liberty to read Because I think it's a very so. bad policy to discuss these mm -hmm. things without Mr. Hoover's known about it. This is a matter that ought to be released by J. Edgar Hoover uh, before we deal with it in this room. Mr. Hoover has examined the document and has advised me that he never wrote any such letter. And because the document constitutes an unauthorized use of information which is classified as confidential, it is my opinion that it should not be made public. Now, Mr. Collier, as I understand your testimony, this document that I hold in my hand is a carbon copy of precisely nothing. Is that right? I will say that Mr. Hoover informed me that it is not a carbon copy of a memorandum prepared or sent by the FBI. Let's have it straight from the shoulder. So far as you know, it's a carbon copy of precisely nothing. So far as I know, it is, yes. And so far as you know, this document in this courtroom sprung yesterday by Senator McCarthy is a perfect phony. Mr. Chairman, this has been referred to as a phony by Mr. Welch. That's one of the most serious reflections upon the integrity of the chairman that we've had so far, and I've had many reflections upon my integrity. Uh, Senator McCarthy, uh, you are bound to be aware of the fact that some attack has been made upon that letter. Let me make it very clear, Mr. Jenkins and Mr. Chairman, that I will not under any circumstances reveal the source of any information which I get as chairman of the committee. Now, one of the reasons why I have been successful, I believe to some extent, in exposing the, uh, communism is because the people who give me information from within the government know that their confidence will not be violated. There is no way on earth that any committee, any force, can get me to violate the confidence of those people. Senator McCarthy, and we are trying to pursue this question to its logical end so that the committee may know all of the facts. That two and a quarter page document was delivered to you by someone from the Army. Mr. Jenkins. And Mr. perhaps in the Intelligence Department, can you go that far? An officer in the Intelligence Department. Senator McCarthy, 
When you took the stand, you, of course, understood you were going to be asked about this letter, did you not? I assume that would be the subject. And you, of course, understood you were going to be asked the source from which you got it. Mr. Welch, you are not the first individual who tried to get me to betray the confidence and give out the names of my, my informants. You will be no more successful than those who have tried in the past, period. I am only asking you, sir, did you realize when you took that oath that you were making a solemn promise to tell the whole truth to this committee? I understand the oath, Mr. Welch. Thank you, sir. Then tell us who delivered the document to you. The answer is no. You will not get that information. You wish then to put your own interpretation on your oath and tell us less than the whole truth? Mr. Welch, I think I've made it very clear to you that neither you nor anyone else will ever get me to violate the confidence of loyal people in this government who give me information about communist infiltration. I repeat, you will not get their names, you will not get any information which will allow you to identify them so that you or anyone else can get their job. McCarthy weigert sich, die Namen seiner Informanten preiszugeben. Sein System des Quellenschutzes hat ihn lange Zeit davor bewahrt, Behauptungen auch beweisen zu müssen. Doch diese Regel wird nun nicht mehr akzeptiert. According to testimony presented this committee yesterday, the officer informant who gave this obviously fraudulent letter was guilty of sending secret information to somebody not authorized to receive it, and in so doing, disobeyed the orders of his superiors. In view of the testimony, Mr. Chairman, I do hope that every effort will be made to find out who was the informant. But at least as important should be knowledge on the part of the eight government agencies who sit on the Intelligence Advisory Committee that they may now have in their midst someone who is willing, for whatever reason he considers proper, to distribute secret information to unauthorized people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No directive will preclude me from examining material bearing upon the security of this nation. The senators must, if they are to perform their duty, must see the sequence of letters from the FBI in which they point out day after day what a dangerous situation you have in our top secret radar laboratory. Why the tremendous efforts have been made to call this committee off the investigation, the disclosure of communists in government. Mr. Chairman, if the Attorney General has some good reason why these documents should not be made available to the committee, he should not be bashful about coming down in executive session and telling us why, Mr. Chairman. I don't want any of your confidential information. Senator, All I want is let the country get this legal question so we can all operate within the law, if that's possible. I say as for myself, you say what you'll do and what you'll not do. I tell you, Senator, that I will not set myself up above and apart from the law. I'm going to conform to it. Well, now, you do as you please. Well, Senator, yeah. you. But, Senator, I, we have a duty to do our job even though we may differ with a perfectly honest version of what the president thinks his job is. You say I'm trying to put you in jail. I'm asking no such thing. You've reached the crossroads in this thing. And we're, we're entitled in the course of these hearings now to have this thing settled if there's any way to settle it. Senator McCarthy, do you think that President Eisenhower could put any classification on the secret document? which would prevent you from being a person authorized to receive an exam. Now, your question was, does Mr. Eisenhower have what? President Eisenhower, sir. President Eisenhower have what? I guess the answer is yes or no. Der Unterausschuss des Senats fordert Roy Cohn auf, die berühmte Liste mit rund 100 kommunistischen Agenten vorzulegen, die verschiedene Regierungs- und Armeebehörden unterwandert haben sollen. In this now famous two and a quarter page document, there were about 35 names listed. This is pretty serious. Have we had anything as serious as this so far? Oh, yes, I think we've got something much more serious right now. Uh, uh, 
Right, listen. Well, I'm talking about up yes, to the yes. prior to this hearing. May, may, I answer, may I answer that question, Mr. Chairman? Right. I think we've got a much more serious situation now in communist infiltration of the CIA. Disturbs me beyond words. Well, we haven't. The members of the committee have not been advised, and I do think that... Oh, yes, they have. Oh, yes, they have. Have we... Uh, the names and uh, of the people... I, I've discussed this matter with the members of the committee. I've also discussed with the members of the committee the question of communist infiltration of atomic and hydrogen bomb plants. I felt that was... I think even more important than this infiltration at... Uh, may I... Uh, may, may, uh, may, uh, just just let me finish and view this one, one point. May I uh, have from the files all the memos and, and meetings and minutes with reference to this matter so that uh, we on the committee can be fully informed? You, you, you certainly may, Senator. Certainly may. Well, may I ask the distinguished chairman, have we yet received the names, and I assume they're in the file, of this claimed 133 communists that are ready for investigation. I've asked for it. You know that I have been tied up here day and night with this investigation. I frankly don't have the time now, and that's one of the reasons why I object to this show continuing on the road. Mr. Cole, what is the exact number of communists or subversives that are loose today in these defense plans? The exact number that is loose, sir? Yes, sir. I don't know. Well, that's 130, is that right? Uh, yes, sir, I'm gonna try to particularize for you if I can. I'm in a hurry. I don't want the sun to go down while they're still in there, if we can get them out. I'm afraid we won't be able to work that way. Well, I've got a suggestion about it, sir. How many are there? I believe the figure is approximately 130. Approximately 130. Yes, those are people, Mr. Welch. Uh, I don't care. You've told us who they are. Are you alarmed at that situation, Mr. Cole? Yes, sir, I am. Nothing could be more alarming, could it? Certainly a very alarming thing. Will you not, before the sun goes down, give those names to the Department of Defense tonight? Would you mind doing that? Whatever the committee directs on that, sir. I, I wish the committee would direct that all the names be sent both to the FBI and to the Department of Defense with extreme suddenness. Angesichts der Angriffe durch Joseph Welch zieht McCarthy seine letzte Trumpfkarte aus dem Ärmel und kündigt eine erstaunliche Enthüllung über einen von Welchs Mitarbeitern an. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Welch has request that uh, the information be given once we know of anyone who might be performing any work for the Communist Party. I think we should tell him that he has in his law firm uh, a young man named Fisher, whom he recommended incidentally to do the work in this committee, who has been for a number of years a member of an organization which was named, oh, years and years ago, as the legal bulwark of the Communist Party. Now, I have hesitated bringing that up, but I have been uh, rather bored with your phony request to Mr. Cohen here that he personally get every communist out of government before sundown, therefore, we will give you the information about the young man in your own organization. Now, I'm not asking you at this time to explain why you tried to foist him on this committee, that you did the committee know, uh, whether you knew that he was a member of that uh, communist organization or not, I don't know. I assume you did not, Mr. Welch, because I get the impression that while you are quite an actor, I don't think you have any conception of the danger of the Communist Party. I don't think you yourself would ever knowingly aid the Communist cause. I think you are unknowingly aiding it when you try to burlesque this hearing in which we are attempting to bring out the facts. Or... Mr. Chairman, well, the Church to say that he has no recognition, no, no memory, of Mr. Welch recommending either Mr. Fisher or anybody else as counsel for this committee. Senator McCarthy, Senator, sometimes you say, may I have your attention? I'm 
May I have your attention? Now, this time, sir, I want you to listen with both. Until this moment, Senator, I think I never really gauged your cruelty or your recklessness. Fred Fisher is a young man who went to the Harvard Law School and came into my firm and is starting what looks to be a brilliant career with us. When I decided to work for this committee, I asked Fred Fisher, I don't know anything about you except I've always liked you. But if there's anything funny in the life of you that would hurt anybody in this case, you speak up quick. And Fred Fisher said, Mr. Welsh, when I was in law school, and for a period of months after, I belonged to the Lawyers Guild, as you have suggested, Senator. And I said, Fred, I just don't think I'm going to ask you to work on the case. If I do one of these days, that will come out and go over national television, and it will just hurt like the Dickens. And so, Senator, I asked him to go back to Boston. Little did I dream you could be so reckless and so cruel as to do an injury to that lad, needlessly inflicted by you. If it were in my power to forgive you for your reckless cruelty, I would do so. Uh, Mr. Wells talks about this being cruel and reckless. He was just baiting. He has been baiting Mr. Cohen here for hours. I did you, I think, no personal injury, Mr. Cohen. No, sir. I meant to do you no personal injury. No. And if I did, I no. beg your pardon. Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. Well, let's, let's... You've done enough. Have you left no sense of decency? Yes, I know this hurts you, Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch talks about any sense of decency. It seems that Mr. Welch is paying so deeply, he thinks it's improper for me to give the record, the Communist Front record, of the man whom he wanted to foist upon this committee. But it doesn't pain him at all. There's no pain in his chest about the attempt to destroy the reputation and the take the jobs away from the young men who are working on my committee. And Mr. Welch, if, if I have said anything here which is untrue, then tell me. I have heard you and everyone else talk so much about laying the truth upon the table that when I heard it was completely phony, Mr. Welch, I have listened to you now for a long time to say, now before sundown, you must get these people out of government. So that I just want to have a very clear, very clear that you were not so serious about that when you tried to recommend this man for this committee. But the point is, Mr. Chair, I'd like to say again that he does not believe Mr. Welch recommended Mr. Fisher as counsel for this committee because he had, through his office, all the recommendations which were made and did not recall any of them coming from Mr. Welch. And that would include Mr. Fisher. Well, let me ask Mr. Welch. You, you brought him down, did you not, to act as your assistant? Mr. McCarthy, I will not discuss this further with you. You have sat within six feet of me and could, ask, could have asked me about Fred Fisher. You have seen fit to bring it out, and if there is a God in heaven, it will do neither you nor your cause any good. I will not discuss it further. I will not ask Mr. Cohen any more witnesses. You, Mr. Chairman, may if you will, Stuart Symington ist verärgert über McCarthys frei erfundene Anschuldigungen und seine aufsehenerregenden, aber unwahren Enthüllungen. Er geht mit Unterstützung des gesamten Ausschusses in die Offensive und beschließt ihm den letzten Stoß zu versetzen. The charge by the junior senator from Wisconsin that we've had another year of treason under President Eisenhower. The charge that the CIA is infiltrated and infested with communists. The charge that the Department of Defense is full of communists. The charge that the Department of Justice, that the Attorney General of the Department of Justice 
There's something phony about him and the charge that the hydrogen bomb plants and the atomic bomb plants are full of communists. Well, where do we go from here as the American people? It would appear some of us want to end up in this country with just plain anarchy. You better go to a psychiatrist. I want no psychological bribes from you. Nobody in the Senate knows more about how to avoid testifying than the junior senator from Wisconsin. And everybody in the United States knows that that fact is true. Different times when they wanted to put you under oath and you didn't want to go. Mr. Symington has said that no one knows better than the senator from Wisconsin how to avoid testifying. I have now at this time made the offer to go on the stand and let him question me about everything. I don't care how irrelevant it is. Mr. Chairman, I have decided to testify under oath before this committee. I believe that I will have performed a public service of overwhelming importance. If any action of mine can induce you to answer under oath the allegations formally preferred against you by the Senate subcommittee and to which you have heretofore persistently refused to respond except to denounce the subcommittee. Accordingly, I propose that we agree on the following points. You will agree to an investigation by a committee of the Senate. I will agree to take the stand in the present proceeding and to testify as to the events preceding the institution of these hearings. I trust that you will confirm your agreement with this program. If you are in accord, please sign as indicated below. Senator, here's the letter. And if you will sign it, then we can get this matter settled. Uh, uh, Mr. Symington, I think, and I'm glad we're on television, I think the million people can see how low that a man can sink. I repeat, they can see how low an, an alleged man can sink. Senator, let me tell you something. The chair believes that uh, we The American understand. people have had a look at you for six weeks. You're not fooling anyone either. In all the years that I have been in this government, based on the testimony that's been given before this committee under oath, I think the files of what you call my staff, my director, my chief of staff, have been the sloppiest and most dangerously handled files that I have ever known of since I've been in the government. Mr. Chairman, now you can run away if you like, Stu. You can run away if you like. You have been here trying to smear the staff of this committee. You jump up and run away without answering the question. I have asked you a simple question. Do you have, do you have any evidence of any kind to indicate that there's any subversive amongst these young men? If not, if not, you are leaving here this afternoon leaving a smear upon the name of each and every one of them. You shouldn't do that, Mr. Symington. That's just dishonest. That's, that's, the, that's the thing, thing that the Communist Mr. Party Chairman, has been doing too Chairman, long. Apparently, every time anybody says anything against anybody working for Senator McCarthy, we'll just answer he is the smearing them and is he accusing them of communism. Just answer the question. Do you know of any subversive? That's the best answer that I can get. Do you know of any Even though the chair is leaving, even though the chair is leaving, I want to make this record. And Mr. Reporter, will you take this down? Mr. Reporter, will you take this down? Mr. Symington, other members of the Democrat Party here have been intimating that they know of some subversive on the staff investigating communists. I have asked Mr. Symington point blank to tell us whether he knew of any such subversive. He runs away. He won't answer the question. May I say that that is the most dishonest, the most unfounded smear upon some of the most outstanding young men that I have ever seen work to uncover communists. And before this is over, the American people have a, have a better picture of it. I guess we must go and vote now.
Im Dezember 1954 setzt der Senat einen Schlusspunkt unter sein Abenteuer. Im letzten Akt des Dramas spricht der Senat McCarthy das Misstrauen aus, befindet ihn für unwürdig und verurteilt seine irreführenden und aus der Luft gegriffenen Anschuldigungen. Er habe die Wahrheit pervertiert und verdreht und die Würde, Ehre und Autorität des Senats verhöhnt. McCarthy wird von Präsident Eisenhower per Dekret abgesetzt und versinkt im Alkoholismus. Seine letzten öffentlichen Auftritte sind erschütternd. Drei Jahre später, 1957, stirbt McCarthy. Von allen vergessen. <lacht> 